Welcome back, everybody, to the, our ongoing series on Sean McMeekin's book, Stalin's War, A New History of World War II. Continuing right where we left off, I am joined today by writer, author, and friend, T.R. Hudson. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, as soon as you had told me that you had, you had read this book, I, I wanted to have you on, and it's always a, a good excuse to do something with your friends, so... <laughs> oh, definitely. Uh, loving the series so far. And uh, the reason I even know about this book is because of our friend Charlie. So shout out to Charlemagne. And then also shout out to Skeptical Waves who put, uh, you know, a good smattering of quotes from this book on his channel. Uh, and def definitely did a lot of good press for McMeekin. So uh, definitely go check out Skeptical Waves. Yeah, we, we would not be here for many of us without our favorite audiobook merchant, Skeptical Waves. So be sure to follow him and all the work that he's doing, especially at the time of this recording. He's currently demonetized for putting out Ted Kaczynski's uh, manifesto, which is publicly available. And, you know, you can read it on The Washington Post. But if a YouTube guy wants to do an audiobook of it, you get demonetized. So go support our friend Skeptical Waves. And go support our friend T.R. Hudson, who has his new book out, The Perfect and the Wicked, in stores now. And with that, we'll just get started. Um, we, we finished off last time on the Mol uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and sort of the, the lead up to, you know, the invasion of Poland. And uh, now we're going to be talking about Poland today. So um, here we go. Secret though its territorial clauses were, there was little doubt in the West about Hitler's reasons for agreeing to the Moscow or the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. By lifting the threat from the East, the pact enabled Hitler to contemplate an invasion of Poland with relative equanimity. Of course, there was still a grave risk that Britain and France would declare war on Nazi Germany in response. In the short run, however, this was a much lesser danger to the German Wehrmacht than hostile Soviet armed intervention would have been. As neither Britain nor France shared a border with Poland, they would have been hard-pressed to assist it, short of a French invasion of Germany's western frontier or a British blockade of the Baltic, neither of which would slow down the German war machine, owing to Poland's unfavorable geography, to invade from multiple directions simultaneously. France's chief of staff, General Maurice Gamelin, had promised the Polish government that he would hurl the bulk of the, the, of the French army across the Maginot Line within 15 days if Hitler invaded Poland, but there were good reasons to doubt that this would happen. There was little sign of war readiness, much less enthusiasm in Paris, where the political temperature was best captured by the famous question posed on the cover of Louvre on May 4th, 1939. Were Frenchmen truly ready to die for Danzig? And that's that's probably like the worst uh, consequence of this whole, because especially in IR, uh, which I know that you're a big uh, international relations guy, but they talk about the security dilemma a lot. And this moment is brought up a lot as, uh, well, if the British and the French had intervened right away, then World War II would have been, uh, it would have been just a, a, a small border clash uh, for Poland instead of, you know, the, the largest war in human history. And, and that's been the justification uh, for war since. But I think that now that we're sort of, you know, leaving the unipolar world and entering sort of a multipolar world again, you have people asking the questions, are we going to die for Taiwan? Are we going to die for Israel? Are we going to die for Ukraine? And you know, if you pull the the average eighteen year old American, they're going to say no for any of them. Yeah, and I think it's kind of important when we also consider the context of uh, American interest in getting into World War II to begin with, especially in in nineteen thirty nine. America was not at all remotely prepared to go to war, and uh, many were not interested in 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 fighting in another European war. There was still a severe political backlash to getting involved uh, across the Atlantic again after World War One, And there was significant uh, support for, um, you know, the Third Reich inside of America, at least by some prominent individuals, and a strong desire not to get involved uh, outside and, of maybe financial aid. Um, 
and here we are. But yeah, dying dying for Danzig uh, it reminds me very much of like what you had said, dying for Israel, dying for Ukraine, dying for Taiwan. The question always is, you know, what's in it for me? But the security dilemma and additionally the alliance trap, which is played out famously in World War One, and to some extent, you know, uh, become sort of the motivating and animating reason for France and Britain to get involved in these treaties uh, in World War Two. And I mean, again, it, these are classic traps and they're known as traps for a reason because you do get dragged into these conflicts. And here we are. And it would have played out a lot different, obviously, if France had made good on their threat to invade from from the West. But then, you know, who's to say that the, the Soviets don't just steamroll uh, through Europe after after the Germans are taken out of out pretty, pretty early? Because one, one of the things that you notice throughout the book is that Stalin has European ambitions. I, I mean, his whole his whole philosophy is uh, world communism. And, and he is a true believer. Uh, maybe not all at once. Uh, I think he I think he was one of the proponents of, uh, you know, communism in one nation first. But especially the way that it shakes out after the war it's clear that he he wants to spread the ideology as far as he can and we we let him yeah we we've covered this in, in chapter one and particularly just what kind of foreign policy animal you were dealing with especially with revolutionary communism um but i i think we can carry on here mm-hmm. Uh, Nor was it clear that Britain would go to war on Poland's behalf, although Chamberlain's government responded to the news of the Moscow Pact by signing a mutual assistance treaty with Poland on August 25th, 1939, valid for five years. Its clauses regarding military cooperation were slippery, as the Poles would soon discover. Britain did not promise to make war, but, quote, at once to give the contracting party engaged in hostilities, i.e. Poland, all the support and assistance in its power, end quote. In practice, this might mean anything from a full-scale invasion of the country attacking Poland to the dispatch of military aid or the disbursement of war loans. Even those less helpful options were not ironclad in view of Britain's poor track record on Polish arms requests since Chamberlain's supposed guarantee of March 31. Nor did the Mutual Assistance Treaty specify which country Britain expected to invade Poland, as worded the treaty could apply to either the USSR as much as it did to Nazi Germany. Nonetheless, the renewed British overture to Warsaw was enough to give Hitler pause. Insofar as his agreement with Stalin eliminated the immediate danger of a two-front war of the kind Germany faced in 1914, the Moscow Pact was a coup. But the pact, as Hitler would now learn, had left many questions in the open as it had answered. What it stated was that each party must decline to lend its support to or participate in any grouping of powers to fight the other. Diplomatically speaking, Molotov and Stalin had really done was declare neutrality in the war they hoped would now break out between Germany, Poland, and Western powers. But such a war was not the kind Hitler wanted, even if it was obviously better than one that would pit Germany against those of uh, against those Western powers, Poland and the Soviet Union too. If Britain and France, unfazed by Hitler's diplomatic coup in Moscow, chose to go to war with him over Poland anyway, then all Ribbentrop had really accomplished was to reduce the enemy coalition facing Germany by one. But in the supposed partnership between Berlin and Moscow, Hitler was running all the risk, while Stalin could simply sit back and wait for the other capitalist powers to attack each other. Which has been, uh, you know, according to McMeekin, this has been sort of Stalin's goal the entire time. Uh, If you guys listen to chapter one or if you've read this book, you'll know that um, Stalin's sort of Soviet revolutionary foreign policy, very similar to more nuanced, but still similar to other revolutionaries before him, you know, spreading world communism. And if it means that we can, you know, watch all these, you know, monarchical or imperialistic capitalistic states kill each other first, all the easier for us to to mop them up and instill communism. It really... uh... It really demonstrates that Lenin quote, uh, we will hang the capitalist with the rope that he sells us. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, and a very important thing to consider there is is that that was the logic and the modus operandi for uh, this foreign policy. Small wonder that Hitler hesitated in the last days of August 1939, postponing his original launch date for the invasion of Poland, August 26th, and opening a 
back channel diplomatic communications with London through Swedish businessman friendly with the Prussian minister, uh, pr uh, with the Prussian minister president Hermann Goring, better known to the British as Mr. G. What Hitler had in mind after learning of the Polish British agreement of August 25th, according to Mr. G, was a compromise settlement between assigning both Danzig to the Polish corridor of the, to the German Reich, while Warsaw would be compensated with a new Polish corridor, corridor to Gdynia, more ethnically Polish port city northwest of Danzig. While unwilling to accept such terms and justifiably wary of Hitler's motives, Chamberlain agreed on August 27th to send Mr. G back to Berlin to feel out the Germans about more direct negotiations. If Hitler agreed to an international guarantee to balance out German and Polish claims, i.e., you know, Danzig, Gdansk given to Germany with Polish rights guaranteed, the Polish corridor retained by Warsaw with a German right of way, and the prospects for a diplomatic compromise looked favorable. Then Goring might have been invited to come to London to deal with the concluding stages. Over the next three days, a series of high-stakes diplomatic proposals were exchanged between Berlin, Warsaw, and the Western capitals. Even U.S. President Roosevelt took a hand when he informed Whitehall on August 28 that Poland had agreed with direct talks with Germany, a report immediately contradicted by Hitler. The upshot of these probes was a telegram from Berlin, deciphered by the British Foreign Office on August 30th, to the effect, as the Foreign Secretary Halifax interpreted the message, Hitler accepted a discussion with the Polish government, but said that the discussion must start at once in Berlin. He accepted our proposal in regard to an international guarantee of the German Fidanzig Gdansk and the German transit rights in the Polish corridor, but subject to the consent of the Soviet Union. Aside from the novelty of Hitler appealing to Stalin, the ominous demand that a Polish emissary be sent to Berlin to be presented with fate accompli, the kind of cynical maneuver that had preceded German moves against Austria and Czechoslovakia, the impression, the impression Hitler's message left on Halifax was that of a man who was trying to extricate himself from a difficult position. Chamberlain, too, dismissed suggestions that war was imminent and rejected a proposal mooted in the House of Commons to evacuate children from London a precaution already undertaken in Paris. Chamberlain reassured the cabinet in words curiously lacking concern over the fate of Poland that there was no reason to think that Herr Hitler would start operations against us, but would wait for us to attack him. And, and a lot of, you know, people love to shit on Chamberlain, but this is how international relations is done. Uh, you send out diplomats, you try and come to a peace negotiation. Uh, and I, I actually wonder, I, it's funny, I wonder what the diplomats of today would do in a similar situation. And it sounds a lot more like what they, what at least they purport to do rather than, you know, what Nikki Haley goes and, and says, oh, we're going to bomb them all to hell. Uh, I don't know. What What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think that you're seeing a concern about recent memory and playing you know, a large role here. Remember, this is, of course, what you would have uh, called the phony war, you know, preparation right before World War II kicks off that you might be seeing uh, an invasion take place or that we're going to see gas attacks happen again and there's going to be readiness which of course uh you know chemical weapons like we saw in the trenches of world war one were not used um in any like significant offensive degree in world war ii at all uh, and but at the same time right like you know britain has not recovered from world war one and britain and, and france are both you know prepping up for the next war, everyone kind of, I think, walked away from Versailles knowing that something is going to happen again. And even the British knew this very early on. And so, you know, for, I guess, in comparison to today, the recent memory for the foreign policy establishment in America is, well, we won the Cold War and we've, we've dicked around in the Middle East before with little to no international pushback and we haven't faced any severe consequences and we can do it again. So America doesn't have a memory like World War II um, or even really Vietnam. I mean, like when we consider the, the political leadership of even George W. Bush's years, even John Kerry and George W. Bush are famously of similar age and remember Vietnam in their own right. Now, Bush, of course, never served in Vietnam. Kerry did famously through his medals, you know, back at the White House. But we don't have that kind of memory. 
So, you know, nowadays it's just going back to Iraq and Afghanistan or bombing Gaddafi or something. It's not, there's little civilizational memory to, to the United States' State Department or its foreign policy establishment. And I, I think that, that this is such a huge difference between the old world and the new world is this, that these guys were alive for the First World War. It was only 20 years ago. Churchill famously, you know, had the Gallipoli campaign. Chamberlain, you know, remembers it vividly. I mean, these are things that are seared into the, the minds of a British people. Whereas for America, especially today's America, it's so deracinated, uh, you know, multi-ethnic, it doesn't really have a solid identity that, you know, we don't have that. And I think that that's sort of an important thing to consider when, you know, how, how much of a comparison can we make from 80 years ago to today? You know, we're talking like three generations of people. That's a fair point. I guess I was thinking in, in the, the realm of, I mean, it's clear that Russia is going to win the Ukraine war. It was probably clear. It was clear to uh, Frog Twitter, like right after the invasion took place, that this was the eventual uh, outcome. And now you you see the the mainstream media kind of coming to terms with with that eventuality. And I wonder, you know, on the one hand, I guess I, I hold out that there is there's some sort of sense in in the modern State Department uh still kind of running running the show there but um that's that's probably more naivete than and i i have no evidence for that i don't have a lot of hope for this current batch of the state department uh and in part because it's a new class of state department and that uh the usg is in a really weird position where you have an older class of neoconservatism that was focused on like the Middle East and it was more explicitly focused on Israel. And now you have a different class of individuals that are focused on Russia, Ukraine, and now they're kind of like fighting the, the two inside. There's sort of this internal battle going on. I mean, clearly Israel, I think, takes more priority for American foreign policy interests as the Middle East has always had. But, uh, you know, I people get upset in regards to territorial disputes or things like that these are this is the oldest aspect of like human relations on a civilizational scale and that i i do and looking at these claims and we we've looked at this on the maps earlier in previous chapters you you see the the aspect to get a hold of prussia or to take over poland and you know get a get a seaport and then if you cut it all the way down to the black sea um you know south of galicia well then what well what's south of that well that would be where modern day Ukraine is, and uh, be where modern day Transnistria is. And you want to see the former Russian territory uh, back to where it is. And that's still, I, to, a, to a civilizational memory, I think, is still there for the Russians. Whether or not they're ever going to get that solid Russian sphere of influence from, you know, Kaliningrad all the way down to Transnistria with a Ukrainian rump state having no access to the Black Sea remains to be seen. I don't think they'll get that. I think they'll get a fair deal out of the Russian-Ukraine uh, war as things wind down and it looks like the Russians are, are going to win or at least get a substantial portion of what they initiated this military operation for. But um, time can only uh, time only will tell for that. Now, I wonder if, uh, if, if there's been a lot of talk lately about Putin taking the whole country. Uh, I don't know if you watched the Durand uh, actually, I think you introduced me to it, so you probably do. I watch them on occasion. Uh, no, I, I they, watch all sorts of people. <laughs> well, yeah, they had a they had an episode with John Mearsheimer and talking about how Putin's plan is not to annex the whole country, but rather just the the four oblasts that uh, are ethnically Russian. And I wonder it, if they did take the whole country that could open up a cause of belly for Poland to try and take back what used to be Polish territory. There's a, there's a desire, I think for the Polish government to get involved. There is a, they, they have an ethnic animus and a, <laughs> and a territorial animus for against the union and the, the Russian people in general that, that uh, Americans are the least racist people on earth. You have to travel abroad to understand what bigotry looks like. And um, sometimes the bigotry is certainly warranted, 
but I, I, I've talked about this with Semyagog and Charlemagne, that there is a lot of U.S. military investment into Poland. Uh, I recall the little issue over a Ukrainian rocket or missile that misfired and landed in Polish territory and allegedly killed a, a civilian or two. And everyone thought that that was going to be the big kickoff for World War Three because Poland doesn't want to be limited by the U.S. government or Article 5. They kind of want to do things on their own. And I, whether or not they do anything remains to be seen. But I, I remember even more neoconservative writers and thinkers like George Friedman, who's a, who's a, he's, he's a Hungarian Jew whose family fled the Soviet Union in like the, the 1950s or so. And he was talking about like Poland would probably want to put itself in a superpower status or a regional power status by the mid, you know, 21st century. So we'll see. I mean, only time will tell. But Which is, um, yeah, it's, it's really funny how uh, history kind of rhymes, because we'll see later in this chapter that the Polish, uh, the Polish army and the Polish government uh, believe that they can fight off the Germans because of a, a, a military victory that they'd won 20 years prior or almost 20 years yeah and i mean if if the polish government has war plans i would hope that they're taking really good notes at how this ongoing war in ukraine and the ongoing conflicts and uh israel and gaza are playing out because you know, I, I think people are, are brutally waking up to the fact that this is not 1992 where you can storm in with a bunch of, you know, jet powered tanks that uh, are super hot. And then you can detect them on thermals and people just drop like drones with, you know, things that only cost like 80 bucks to make. Uh, I, I hope people are taking notes because whatever war comes next is going to be nothing like what we grew up with. Probably a slog, honestly. Oh, absolutely. Uh, meanwhile, Mr. G reported later on August 30th that while Hitler had been insisting on recovering all Polish territories, which had been the pre-war boundaries of Germany, Goring had badgered him down to settling only for Danzig on the Poli and the Polish corridor. Of course, this was still more than the Polish leaders, bolstered by the new pact of August 25th, and, um, and their understandable, if misguided, conviction that Britain and France would support them with genuine military action against Germany were willing to give up. Britain's good faith approach to Hitler's entreaties had, for now, stayed his hand. But our, but for our reply, Mr. G told Halifax and Chamberlain, war would have broken out on Tuesday morning, August 29. In the view of Hitler's well-known plans to invade Poland, last-minute diplomatic machinations such as these are often dismissed as irrelevant. According to this view, they may have truly all all that they may have truly done was postpone the clash of arms between Germany and Poland by a few days. But by the week of August 1939, the Wehrmacht was for, fully mobilized on high alert. The Polish general mobilization had been declared on August 28th, rescinded the following day, and then resumed confusingly on August 30th. Going through your book there? Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to. <laughs> no, you're good. I, I figured. Uh, I, I have a copy in front of me. The PDF's just good to have. Border violations on the German-Polish frontiers were occurring every day. Despite Hitler's blustering, the intimidation was just not on the German side. The Polish government, the printing press, radio stations, and Polish diplomats were full of big talk and thumping the about thumping the Wehrmacht, drawing on the confidence that they had defeated the Soviet Union only 19 years before. On August 31st, Poland's ambassador to the Reich, Joseph Lipski, reported to Warsaw that if war began, riots would break out in Germany and Polish troops would march successfully to Berlin. This sounds familiar. Uh, yeah, a little familiar. <laughs> Just a little. Uh, you know, all, all we got to do is uh, soon there'll be Russian rioters in the streets and the Ukrainians will be marching on Moscow in a matter of weeks. Um, I hate to inform the NAFO fellas that didn't play out that way. We must remember that no war is inevitable. It is significant that Hitler displayed cold feet in the last days of August 1939, sensing that he was leading Germany into a larger conflict than he had bargained for. Although willing to assume the risk of British and French intervention over Poland, Hitler did not desire this intervention. As he had told his generals on May 23rd, in case of a war with Poland, there must be no simultaneous conflict with the West. Still less, there was a sign of war lust in the German public, whatever Hitler's mood. Nor was there a breath of war enthusiasm in Paris and London. After learning of the British invasion of Poland on the morning of September 1st, it took the British and French governments two days to respond, and even their ultimatums were not coordinated. 
The British one delivered on 9 a.m. September 3rd expired two hours later, one hour before France's own ultimatum was delivered to Berlin. Chamberlain's attitude remains difficult to fathom. At one point in late August, the Prime Minister expressed alarm at the lack of news from Warsaw on the progress of German-Polish negotiations, though not because he was afraid silence pointed to war. Rather, Chamberlain was disturbed at the possible but very distasteful explanation that Polish negotiators, in fact, were giving way to Germany, depriving Britain of Kostas Belli. The mood in Poland, despite the defiant boasting of Ambassador Lipsky in Berlin, was far more anxious than belligerent in view of Germany's obvious advantage, advantages in strategic geography and the order of battle. So that, is that, that's an interesting side of Chamberlain that doesn't get discussed uh, nearly enough. Uh, he's he's sort of the, the coward, the, uh, the peace in our time, the, the appeaser, uh, but, but here he is hoping hoping to get into the fight and worried that his his opportunity to do so was slipping away yeah i mean he did have conservative party detractors and of course there was the whole churchill situation he was incredibly worried about but uh you, you know yeah the the popular media consensus illustrates neville chamberlain as someone who wasn't willing to do the morally correct thing and fight the nazis and so, you know, he had to be put away. And of course, he would die of a, of a, of a disease later, shortly after stepping down. But it, it does illustrate, right, that we have this post-war mythopoetic consensus that only cowards, you know, don't, you know, don't punch Nazis or whatever, or only Nazis don't punch Nazis. And so, you know, he had to step to the wayside. But instead, you know, he's also considering that, oh, I, I may not have my war guarantee. I may not have my reason to to stay in office in, in the midst of these negotiations. And I may have to play a whole different game of politics if by some way these uh, these treaties about negotiating things, and I'm just going to be known as an even bigger appeaser or lukewarm politician. Again, so much of this we, we will never know because history never played out the way that um, one might have hoped in avoiding this great conflict. But yeah, let's see here. There was only one statesman in Europe who truly relished the prospect of a general war breaking out over Poland, Stalin. As Molotov boasted of the Supreme Soviet on August 31st, Stalin had outmaneuvered the ruling classes of Britain and France who had tried to goad the Soviet Union into a war with Germany. Instead, it was Western capitalist powers who now stood on the brink of the war with, right, with the Reich, a war which the Soviet Union would maintain absolute neutrality. Molotov reserved special opprobrium, or opprobrium for the French Socialists and Britain's Labour Party, those on the left who had been so enthusiastic about collective security. If these gentlemen, he scoffed, want with such impregnable desire to wage war, then let them wage this war themselves without the Soviet Union. We will then see what kind of warriors they are. And uh, if you've ever followed the, the Cold War series with Peek and Jonas and Thomas 777, or have done some reading on Soviet foreign policy on the Cold War independently, you'll know that the Soviet Union leans really hard into British labor as well as French socialists uh, during the Cold War, despite being enemies. There's a lot of domestic politicking and interference in both of those governments. And uh, if you ever want to know how the MiG-15 gets its engine, comes from Britain's labor government. Um, but that's a I'm simplifying things, but that's it's a it's an interesting story in and of itself. But the Soviet Union was very much involved with um, French and British left uh, labor and political movements. Well, even and even before the Cold War, uh, in in one of the chapters that you covered previously, uh, the Soviet Union is uh, their diplomats are kicked out of England because of how much interference they're running. Uh, yeah, and. You, it, it, it's almost, you know, you have Stalin saying that, oh, these guys are going to go to war by themselves. Uh, let's see what kind of warriors they are. Meanwhile, it's it's very likely, at least it's, it's within the realm of possibility that, uh, you know, NKVD uh, sleeper agents, whoever are in these countries, whoever are running uh, point for the, the French Socialists and for the Labour Party are encouraging this uh, war fever. 
Uh, so it's kind of it, it's a, it's another example of Stalin kind of talking out both sides of his mouth. As one would do, uh, as McMeekin has pointed out, that uh, Sto Soviet foreign policy was, you know, if I'm it's it's almost the Frank Herbert quote from Dune. You know, I'll agree to these terms if I'm weaker or if they serve my interest. But the moment they don't, I will, you know, and you're weaker than me. I'll take advantage of you. And um definitely holds very true here with respects to Soviet policy. Safe from German hostility with Hitler's promises of territory in his pocket, Stalin was ideally placed to profit from European war. News of German invasion of Poland was greeted warmly in the Kremlin. No welcome was the new no less welcome was the news than Britain and France declaring war on Germany two days later. As Stalin told the Comintern's general secretary Grigory Dimitrov on September 7th, a war is on between two groups of capitalist countries. We see nothing wrong and they're having a good hard fight and weakening each other. It would be fine if at the hands of Germany, the position of the richest capitalist countries, especially England, were shaken. Hitler, without understanding it or desiring it, is shaking and undermining the capitalist system. For now, Germany, opposed by Poland, Britain, and France, appeared to be weaker. Stalin told Dimitrov, quote, we can maneuver we can maneuver, pit one side against the other to set them fighting with each other as fiercely as possible. The non-aggression pact is to a certain degree helping Germany. Next time we'll urge on the other side, end quote. And that's very reminiscent of what Harry Truman said in the Senate. Like, uh, you know, if the, if the Nazis and the communists are fighting each other, just kind of let them and let them, let them kill each other. Yeah. I mean, if you're any time that we see two enemies or two perceived enemies fighting one another, you know, don't get involved. In the, do not interrupt your enemy when he is making a, a grievous mistake. The only danger from Stalin's perspective was if he displayed too obviously his partiality for Hitler in the conflict, which might conceive Britain, convince Britain or France to declare war on him too. On September 3rd, Ribbentrop wired Ambassador Schulenberg in Moscow, requesting that he ask Molotov whether the Soviet Union would participate in the Polish war as promised and provide relief to the hard-pressed Wehrmacht. Did not Stalin, Ribbentrop asked, consider it desirable for Russian forces to move at the proper time against Polish forces in the Russian sphere of interest and, for their part, occupy this territory? Carefully, Molotov replied on September 5th that the time has not yet come. True, he admitted the Soviet delay meant that the Germans might be forced temporarily to cross the line of demarcation between the two spheres of interest of the two parties, but this was fine by Stalin, so long as the Germans, after doing all the work against the Polish armies, turned down this Polish territory to the Soviet Union. Stalin wished, Molotov explained cryptically, to avoid excessive haste, which might injure our cause and promote unity among our opponents, that is, risk incurring the wrath of Britain and France against the Soviet Union. The Red Army did mobilize on September 5th, yet it did so in all Western Soviet military districts from Finland through the Baltic states, White Russia, Western Ukraine, and Romania, not just against Poland. On September 10, there, to reassure the Germans, Molotov informed Schulenburg that the Soviets had mobilized 3 million troops, although he left unsaid why they had been mobilized. For for the Germans, it was a maddening performance. Hitler's Polish war was going reasonably well so far, although at a heavy human price. Hitler's vacillation at the end of August had allowed German high command, KW, an extra week to prepare into the invasion force, which was reinforced by an extra 21 infantry and two motorized divisions. In the end, the Wehrmacht was able to muster a million and a half troops for a five-pronged invasion of Poland, with a third army sweeping down the north from East Prussia, the 4th Army targeting Danzig along the Baltic coast of northwest Pomerania, the 8th Army crossing east from Breslau, and the 10th Army coming from Silesia, and the 14th Army invading from Slovakia in the south, aiming at Krakow. Over the skies of Poland, the Luftwaffe had seized control of the air, knocking out much, though not all, of the Polish Air Force, outnumbered 5-1 to one on the ground. Having achieved clear sky dominance, the Luftwaffe conducted brutal air raids on Warsaw, Lodz, Krestochowa, Krakow, and Ponzin, or Posen, on 158 towns and cities in all, introducing the world to the terrifying screams of the Stuka dive bomber. The German advantage in the tanks was even more lopsided, about 2,600 to 150. It's nuts that 
that the Polish thought that they stood any sort of chance. And 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 to to their credit, until the Soviets kind of came in and kicked them from behind the knees, they were holding their own quite well. They certainly were, you know, just at the sheer numerical disadvantage. And uh, I think it's important to consider just, again, how long they held out. Um, in regards to when they surrendered and you know for that kind of number the warsaw surrenders on september 27th you you managed to hold out um for about 26 days and you lost 20,000 civilians and i mean this is uh, this of course does not even get into the fact what happens to the polish population once the soviets really start taking over in that territory and Really, all I could probably describe it as is it just an ethnic cleansing? I'm pretty and, sure Katyn is the next chapter. Yeah. So I mean, uh, if you if you thought the fight against the the the, the Reich was bad, uh, wait until Soviet occupation comes next. But again, 26 days with such lopsided odds. The Poles fought bravely, but there was little they could do to slow down the Luftwaffe or the Wehrmacht's mechanized divisions. As early as September 4, just three days into the war, the Polish Council of Ministers ordered the evacuation of the government and the foreign diplomatic corps to Nalitzau on the west bank of the Weichel or Vistula, southeast of Warsaw, by the only direction from which Germany had not invaded the country. But after Krakow fell on September 6th, even Nalitzau was invulnerable, and so the Polish government, along with the British, French, and U.S. ambassadors, fled further east into Polle, east of Tarnpol or Tenopil, in the formerly Russian Ukraine, believing this extremely extremity of eastern Poland was safe from the Germans. Foreign Minister Beck stayed on in Warsaw for now. Um, so, I mean, just three days and you're already, everything's got to go. Everything's got to move. The Blitzkrieg continued. And if I'm, and to those listening or to those uh, following along on YouTube, forgive us for butchering these names. Um, the Blitzkrieg continued. On September 7th, the Polish military play base on the Vesterplatt Peninsula guarding Danzig surrendered after a furious bombardment from the Luftwaffe and the German Baltic fleet. 50 miles of Warsaw, 50 miles west of Warsaw, two Polish armies were trapped in a fork between the rivers Bursa and Vistula. Poland's cities were devastated by Luftwaffe bombers, with 25,000 civilians killed in Warsaw alone. Uh, columns of refugees fleeing burn urban infernos were strafed by German fighter planes. To the rear of the advancing armies, German SS divisions terrorized Poles and Jews accused of sabotage or sniping, or in retaliation for Polish attacks on ethnic Germans behind the lines. While such atrocities were not imaginary, some five or 6,000 Polish-German civilians were killed behind Polish lines, the numbers were wildly exaggerated by Nazi propaganda. German countermeasures were pitiless. More than 500 Polish towns and villages were put to the torch, with the local synagogue often providing the first kindling. Captured war prisoners were used as human shields or stripped of their uniforms and gunned down as illegal partisans. Even German sources concede that 16,000 Polish civilians were executed in September 1939, surely a gross underestimate. Another 3,000 Polish war prisoners were dispatched that month. Polish Jews predictably fared worst of all, with tens of thousands expelled from their homes and at least 45,000 executed by year's end. Have you read uh, Bloodlands by... Oh, what's his name? It's he's, He cites him here. Oh, there you go. Yeah, uh, Snyder. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. That's a that's a hell of a book. Um, I have not read Bloodlands. No, it, it goes it goes nauseatingly in depth of, of about you know especially the the civilian casualties uh, in between these two meat grinder armies. I'd have to definitely uh, give it a read then next. Um, and then of course here is our our map of the invasion of Poland, 1939. Uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia are occupied by so the Soviet Union. Here is the Valensky Corridor. So here's, here's Konigsberg, which is now Kaliningrad today, which is a Russian territory. And then you, you look at where this little territory is, and you look at where Warsaw, Dorno, you know, 
all you you notice how we're talking about like the Valensky corridor with Vilnius earlier here in how important this corridor is with respects to how the Soviet Union and how it interacts with Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia. Consider we have our own corridor right here as well when it comes to, to, to Kaliningrad. And it's uh, known as the Suvalki Gap. So again, much of this territory uh, we still see often discussed today. And you wonder why the Polish state and its government, its people, are um, much more conservatively aggressive when it comes to, say, dealing with Russia or dealing with what, la what later down here becomes uh, Ukrainian territory. Because there's Laval, you know, Lemberg, Lov, Liv. There's Ukraine. There's the Dnitzer, the Dnipro River. Um, and a lot of this territory, Galicia, that's, we're, they're going to lose this later out, um, after the war. But, uh, here you, we have everything that we were just describing in the text for those listening, or if those who have their own book, you can see this map on your own book in the chapter. And yeah, uh, very important for us to consider. Now, I wonder, Go I wonder when in the planning for Barbarossa, uh, or, or how deep into the planning of Barbarossa the the okw is at this time uh during the the polish uh invasion and i wonder if if the germans just think oh we can we can take all this territory and then give it to the soviets because we're just gonna invade later anyway because they take a lot of territory that they just give back to the soviets and at least and in, in you know we're i'm getting a little he ahead of us uh in the book but mcmeekin uh basically doesn't understand why this is given back. No, but I, I imagine that we can, when we get to the section on, on Barbarossa, there are some external sources that I'll probably introduce in the series and um, that goes into detail about the planning of it. Cause you only, by the time Barbarossa is enacted, you're in a much different strategic outlook. When you look at a relatively pacified France, there's no likelihood of land invasion on your Western front that, you know, small sacrifices can be made early that we can get back later. Um, but again, we'll, we'll get that to that section in due time. The campaign so far was just as rapid and ruthless as Hitler could have hoped. True, he had not secured the neutrality of Britain and France, which put Germany's long-term strategic position at risk. But there was little sign of a decisive military action from London and Paris. The Royal Air Force made a few uh, Delsatory raids on the German ba Baltic coastal area, but mostly they dropped propaganda leaflets, not bombs. The British Expeditionary Force began a slow-motion deployment across the Channel, which impressed neither Britain's French allies nor the Germans. The French armies crossed the German frontier near Saarbrücken, but then stopped. It was a shameful performance from Poland's Western allies, all but ensuring defeat. The most serious consequence of British and French passivity lay in its impact on Stalin's decision-making. Far from hiding the jackal-like opportunism of so the Soviet position, Molotov told Schollenberg point-blank on September 10 that Stalin would only move after Warsaw fell. The pretext would be that when Poland ceased to exist, the Red Army was acting to protect endangered Ukrainians and Belarusians. Please let us know, Molotov told Schollenberg, when you expect to capture Warsaw for appearances. Uh, for appearances' sake, we should not cross Poland's border until the capital had fallen. And yet the Poles refused to give in to Stalin's frustration and to Molotov's embarrassment. Just as the brave Poles were defending Warsaw highlighted the fecklessness of Britain and France, they exposed Soviet duplicity and cowardice. With Poland largely beaten and no sign of Western intervention, what were the Russians waiting for? Um, that, must have, that must have pissed off a lot of mainstream historians. Uh, what McMeekin wrote there, just calling calling the the communists cowards <laughs> oh i mean I, I i will give i will give sean mcmeekin all the props in the world for uh i mean just just engaging in not not revisionist history but damn near close yeah and and McMeekin is one of the last few mainstream historians that I have a lot of respect for. And you and I have talked off the air about how much we both like him. His book on the Russian revolution is very good. 
uh, and it's a good modern text which takes advantage of a lot of uh, Soviet archives that are only just beginning to still be available to Westerners and Western historians. But he also understands, you know, how to look at things, I guess, in a less progressive or a less contemporary lens. He's not a revisionist, uh, and people who call this book revisionist, I think, play their hand at what kind of partisans they are. This book simply just tells you, even in the most quote unquote normy way possible, that, you know, for as much focus as uh, the West likes to give to Mr. Hitler, um, you, you need to understand the, uh, the actions of the Soviets and what kind of man Joseph Stalin really was. Because as much as you can, you know, in the modern context, hate Hitler, you really need to be hating Stalin more. Or at least understand uh, that you had unfortunately made a deal with the devil, if not outright created him in the Cold War and the the tens of you know millions of people that would die um, after World War II and even before World War II. Wehrmacht commanders could not make heads or tails of Soviet intelligence intentions. Since the beginning of September, German army intelligence reported on September 13, we have observed the movement of vehicles, horses, and reserves in Russia, but the extent of the mobilization remains unclear. Kind of reminds me of uh, February of uh, 2022. Um, but the extent of the mobilization remains unclear. The German high command reckoned that the Germans had concentrated about 600,000 troops on the western borders of the Soviet Union, but they these were not all on the Polish frontier. The Soviet mobilization pattern showed, showed equal strength north and south of Pripyat marshes, with a Belarusian army focused on central Poland, and with a Ukrainian one that might move into southeastern Poland, but which might equally be well poised to invade Romania. So effective was Stalin's camouflaging of the Soviet military posture that when the Red Army finally crossed the Polish frontier in the early morning of September 17, 1939, the, ooh, excuse me, the move came as a surprise to both Polish and German commanders on the ground. The timing was opportune. On September 12th, German troops had crossed the Molotov-Ribbentrop demarcation lines into Soviet Poland, suggesting that there would soon be little left of Poland's carcass to occupy. On September 15th, Stalin agreed to Tokyo's armistice at the request of the wake of Zhukov's crushing victory at Kalkin Gol, which reassured him that the Japanese threat in the Far East was receding. Finally, on September 16th, a German communique announced the fall of Warsaw, erroneously, but no one knew this yet. Stalin decided he could wait no longer to seize his Polish prize. So he finally had the, yeah, the time I mean, to move in. Uh, no... I mean, he's he had time the whole time, but uh, I guess he I, I guess he saw the the writing on the wall that uh, that Germany was about to take all of Poland without him. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, e even then, right? That we were just reading earlier that you know some crossing of the demarcation lines would be fine, but I, I think that it would look optically bad for you know the the general leader of the Soviet Union to have uh, German troops crossing your own agreed upon lines for which territory you were going to seize. You couldn't wait until the end of the, the month when Warsaw officially declared its surrender. But yeah, we can't have, also, we, can't, we can't have Germans on too far off the line. It would, it would also look worse, um, you know, internationally. I mean, the whole reason that they waited was so that um, the Western powers wouldn't see them as uh, aggressors, but if they just come in and mop up, which is what they essentially do, but if they waited any longer and then demanded the the Germans hand over the territory that they didn't take, it would just look like it, it would look like uh, you know war profiteering. Well, not war profiteering, but it would look it wouldn't look good. I, I, I struggle for the word, but you know what I'm trying to say. Can we get an optics check? You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta look good at home as well as abroad. Um, what followed was one of the ugliest episodes in modern diplomatic history. With his countrymen locked in a bitter struggle for their for their existence, Poland's ambassador to Moscow, Wasla uh, Grzybowski, was summoned to the Kremlin at 3 a.m. on September 17th and when handed an ersatz declaration of war. 
The Polish state no longer exists and was unable to protect Russia's brothers of the same blood, Ukrainians and Belarusians. Molotov informed the bewildered ambassador Stalin had ordered the Red Army to cross the border and take under their protection the lives and properties of Western uh, the lives and properties of the inhabitants of Western Ukraine and Western Belarusia. Because Poland had forfeited its existence, Grzybowski was told his diplomatic immunity had been expired, and he was promptly arrested by the NKVD, along with the Polish consul in Kiev, um, Janusz Matuszynski. Um, ooh. ooh. I, have to, ooh. <laughs> I have to imagine that uh, Polish ambassador to the Soviet Union has to be the worst job ever. Oh, yeah. I, uh... I, I can't imagine that that uh, would have gone very well. <laughs> but awesome. I can't just imagine being w woken up at 3 a.m. to tol be told your country doesn't exist anymore. You've lo you forfeited the right to live. We're, we're arresting you. And please come here with the, the secret police so we can torture, and you know. And to, to quote Norm MacDonald, uh, the only job worse is crack horror. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically also, that. In terms of the uh, the Kiev thing, uh, I'm pretty sure this book came out before. It did. It did. Yeah, I'm so I'm just I'm being so just McMeekin McMeekin can be forgiven for not using the correct nomenclature, dude. Yeah, uh, McMeekin is fine in in this instance. You know, he wasn't there when when Chicken Kiev became Chicken Kiev, so it's okay. Uh, this book was not was written before the war. Uh, the statesmen, diplomats, and command officers inside Poland fared a little better. Having evacuated southeast from Warsaw, then further east, Poland's leaders found themselves directly in the path of the Soviet advance. Far from an afterthought, the Soviet invasion was the defining moment, the critical catalyst in Poland's destruction. Until the Pol Soviet pincers moved closed in, Polish high command had gamely regrouped in eastern Poland to fight on, even while Warsaw was conducting a heroic defense. But now... In practical terms, resistance was hopeless. Marshal Edward Smigli Ritz, Poland's commander in chief, informed Poland's civilian leaders at Kolomny, today southwestern Ukraine, at 11:30 a.m. on September 17th. The meeting had to break up after the Red Army grew near and chased everyone southwest towards the Romanian border. In the frontier town of Kuti, a council was held at which Marshal Smigli Ritz, Foreign Minister Beck, and Poland's Premier and President, and the French, Turkish, Romanian ambassadors huddled to determine if Poland might continue the war from abroad, and if so, where. At 8 p.m., word came that the Red Army had closed within 18 miles, and so Poland's leaders gave up the ghost, fleeing into Romania without securing permission to continue the war. In effect, they were hostages. In his last directive to the Polish army, Smigli Ritz announced that the Soviets have crossed the border. I hereby declare a total withdrawal to Romania and Hungary via the shortest available routes. Do not fight the Bolsheviks unless they attack first or attempt to disarm our forces. End quote. The Soviet invasion was also cut off the best escape route to neutral Romania for Poles, Jews, and other civilians fleeing Nazi terror. The bewildered residents of eastern Poland, abandoned by their commander-in-chief and their government, had no idea where the Grey Army decorated with red stars was going or whether it came as friend or foe. In Tarnopol, or Ternopil, Stanislaw and Rovo city officials urged residents to welcome the Soviet invaders. Many Jews rejoiced at the news that the Red Army had arrived. At Jedwabane, the large banner was raised we welcome you a young communist sympathizing pole fleeing east from the germans was stopped by a patrol near rovno later recalled his astonishment to see soviet military uniforms and hear the russian language so far from the soviet frontier had the mighty red army he wondered come to fight the nazis and expel them from poland hoping to express his joy at seeing them the pole was surprised when he and his companions were instead ordered to put up our hands, whereupon they were placed under arrest and deported east into the Soviet Union. That's very nice. Now face this wall. Yeah, basically. It's very nice that you like us. Uh, yeah, c come with us. You're, you're going to a work camp. And yeah, if you thought... Yeah, imagine fleeing further east and being like, oh, thank God, the Soviets are here. Uh, yeah, I, I don't famous think, last I don't, words. Yes, I don't think anybody survived that. Uh declaration no um did not did not end well uh for really anybody in this instance you know but here here we go 
Illusions about the benign intentions of the invader were quickly dashed. Soviet leaflets instructed Polish enlisted men to kill your officers and generals and drive them from your land. Red Army gunners, tank crews, and riflemen open fired on Polish forces near Grodno, Sazak, near Brest, Litvosk, and 40 other locations. None of these battles lasted very long, but they were not mere skirmishes either. An idea of the ferocity of this forgotten war can be gleaned from Soviet casualty figures in what was supposed to be a mop-up peacekeeping operation. 246 killed, 503 wounded on the Belarusian front, 491 dead, almost 1,400 wounded on the Ukrainian front, in all 737 dead, 1,862 wounded, or almost 2,600 casualties. Losses among the Polish defenders were predictably higher, amounting to between six and 7,000 killed and 10,000 wounded. You have, Bloody... to also, oh, sorry, you have to also understand uh, the, the Soviets tried this before in the 20s. Uh, it was a much worse off Red Army at the time. I believe they were still fighting the Civil War. If not, the Civil War had just ended. And uh, there's actually a really interesting set of short stories by Isaac Babel called Red Cavalry uh, that, I, that I recommend people read. Uh, that's basically uh, the the tales of invading Poland from the Soviet perspective. Hmm. I have not read those, but I, I certainly would like to now. Um, my my fat. The more I've been prepping and getting guests on for the show, my desire for more World War II history has just been turned into overdrive. So I, I'm probably definitely gonna have to look into that stuff in general, or at least, you know, the Russian Civil War. I, we have to, no one has done a greater job, I think, at highlighting it in the popular sort of e-right consensus than um, our mutual friend, Mystery Grove, for the general Wrangle books. Oh, definitely. Always with honor and such. I, those things are valuable information to understand just how bad things were during the revolution, the fight to, to stave off the Bolsheviks. And then, you know, this grand sort of world war two narrative that oftentimes gets dismissed, unfortunately. And McMeekin kind of highlights just how bad international Bolshevik communism was. And we, we see it here that, you know, if, if you were a, a young man who had witnessed communist terror, you would understand why, you know, supporting a reactionary force to communism, which is by all extent in understanding fascism, you understand where they're coming from at the very least, whether you yourself are a fascist or not, you know, if I'm witnessing bombings and all sorts of stuff, you, you, you see a recipe for reaction and, and that's what plays out. And here we are. But yeah, um, I, I got to read more into how, the early Soviets did in the midst of right after the war and how they fought with others. Cause I mean, you, you had a Finnish civil war right after the, the Bolsheviks took over and the Bolsheviks lost or the, the communist forces lost in Finland. And no one talks about that at all. I think the only person who talks about it in the English speaking world, I think has just recently been Charles Haywood by reading like five books that are like the only books in English about the subject. So it really does tell you how little we know how much literature there is available to us in the English speaking world about these counter Bolshevik counter communist actions. Yeah. And when it comes to the, the Finnish, everybody knows about Simo Haya or Hyatt Haya. I think it's uh, the, the, the Soviet sniper. Uh, the, the, uh, the, so the, the guy the who, Finnish, the, the Finnish, Finnish sniper. sniper. Yeah, yeah. Who, and everybody's like, Oh, he's such a badass," And nobody kind of puts together that he was uh, fighting for, the third reich in some in some respects uh as uh as one he, of was my, least, he was at least supplied by the third reich as one is one of my favorite um to quote a, to, to quote a video game left out that little detail did he <laughs> uh everyone yeah in the same way everyone forgets and commies will deny it that um that oh by the way you know this myth of stalinizing and industrializing uh you know, the, the, the Bolshevik, you know, red army and the Soviet union, you know, it is done by the hands and techniques of American capitalists, not because the communist system's so great, but again, this book is, the, the, you know, commies will just deny this book exists in general. Um, and my, my big, the big reason why I wanted to, to cover this book and as I've stated elsewhere is to tell people 
that our understanding of communism, the Soviet Union, and World War II is so fundamentally lopsided, and we buy into these leftist mythologies about the war that we forget how compromised America was, how much of a diplomatic crapshoot people in the West took Stalin for, and in turn, how evil communism really is, and that to a large extent, they really did win the war. That's why I give Harry Truman a lot of props, because, uh, and, and I've kind of explained this before, but imagine just being a guy, more or less, who, you know, because of because of political connections, you get to be a senator, and then you get to be vice president, and then suddenly, because FDR dies, he's now the president of the United States, and he makes some really important decisions uh, for the end of World War II, as well as for setting the United States up to fight the Cold War. He may have messed up in Korea. He may have, uh, you know, done a lot, done some damage on the home front. But uh, as far as just some random guy, and I mean, I'm, I'm being a, a little uh, flippant with that. I mean, he was a he was a Mason. He was a artillery officer but in terms of compared to most other presidents he's just kind of a he's a haberdasher from missouri you know what i mean yeah and uh a man who didn't even know about the manhattan project until he's sworn into office he's he's flanked in terms of being president uh by the longest serving president ever who is part of like one of America's richest families. And then the five-star general that won world war two. So he's in between those two guys. Yeah. Sort of a, a, a strange footnote to be in, in terms of history, but still being so monumental. Um, I, I, there's a few good, uh, there's some few good new, I should say, uh, biographies of Truman that I would like to read in the future, but that's a a talk for another time. I really hope that I really like the, and sorry to go off on Truman, but uh, in the Oppenheimer movie, which we talked about on Digital Archipelago, uh, he's he's like a good old boy. Like I, I don't know <laughs> how they, much they, of that they, is they, just... They make him a chud, and it's awesome. The only thing that the Oppenheimer movie did for me was to illustrate that uh, New Deal Democrats are just communists and that uh, you, you can't trust certain types of people and that I really want a Boris, Boris Pash movie more than anything else. After, after Matt Damon's character goes off on Oppenheimer and is like, listen, this guy is the son of an Orthodox archbishop and... Uh, he's been killing communists. Since he's been he killing communists boy. since he was a boy, and I'm like, I want that movie. I want the Boris Pash. They tried to make him biopic. a villain, but no, he's like the coolest guy in that entire fucking movie. <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll we'll carry on. <laughs> Bloody as the Soviet war of aggression was, Stalin for Stalin this was a small price to pay in exchange for acquiring half of Poland along with colossal war booty. As Moscow boasted in a speech to the Supreme Soviet in October 1939, the Red Army in Stalin's undeclared war against an undefended country had captured 900 Polish guns, 1 million artillery shells, 10,000 machine guns, 300,000 rifles, 150 million rounds of ammunition, 300 Polish warplanes. Stalin's territorial hall was still more impressive, with western Belarusia extended by 108,000 square kilometers, which lived on which lived 4.8 million people, and western Ukraine by 88,000 square kilometers, on which lived 8.4 million people. In this way, Stalin expanded his communist empire by nearly 200,000 square kilometers, equivalent to 78,000 square miles, and acquired 13.2 million new subjects, including Poles, 40%. 34% Ukrainians, 8.5% Belarusians, 8.45% of Jews, uh, and some Russians, Germans, Lithuanians, and Czechlo Czechoslovak minorities. Stalin's share of occupied Poland was no, no mere token slice. It was 5,000 miles, 5,000 square miles larger than that of the German share. 
Generally speaking, the Russians and the Germans respected the demarcation line. Both sides shared crucial intelligence on Polish deployments, and the Soviet broadcast radio signals from Minsk to help Luftwaffe pilots navigate and to avoid shooting Red Army Air Force formations. A uh, kind of uh, pidgin occupation slang evolved, with soldiers from each army saluting their counterparts with the curious, and from the Polish perspective, grotesque, greeting Germanski und Bolsheviki zusammen stark. German and Bolsheviks are strong together. Yeah. East of Lau, the, as the Poles called the capital city of Galicia, fought so bitterly in World War I and the Polish-Soviet War of 1920. Soviet and German tanks did briefly exchange fire on September 19 until Soviet officers reminded the Germans that according to the Moscow Pact, Lov, Lemberg to the Germans and Lviv to the Ukrainians fell in the Soviet zone. But there was no significant casualties. The German commander promptly turned over his Polish war prisoners to Soviet captivity and withdrew his troops westward in good order. Okay, anything? All right. No, nothing there. Uh, All right. Pretty self-explanatory. No I think so, too. Uh, nonetheless, there was predictable friction as the armies of Hitler and Stalin divided up Polish spoils. Many German commanders resented being forced to surrender hard-won gains to a Red Army that had done little more than move its men forward, often against light or non-existent opposition. This was particularly true in Lemberg, or Lavau, or Liev, however you want to pronounce it, or which nationality you identify that city with. Um, there was a strong pro-German element dating to the time when the city had belonged to Austria-Hungary. Portraits of the late Habsburg Emperor Franz Joseph were ubiquitous, and 80% of the books on sale in the city were German. The city's Polish commander, Vladislav Langer, spoke German. A delegation of the local property owners had begged Langer to surrender the city to the Wehrmacht, which he had done until the Germans were obliged to hand these unfortunate souls to the mercies of the NKVD. This betrayal, a former rector of the University of Lemberg, told the German officer in November 1939, was bewildering to the local population and remains so today. Um, you know, we ethnically identify with you. Why are you giving us over to the Slavs? Yeah, that's... Uh, I mean, there are many, many not good looks from, from that side of the war, but that's, that's definitely on the list. Yeah, and the... Uh... Uh, almost as if people identify um, along sort of ethnic and linguistic barriers and, and boundaries that people wish to erase these days. Um, but as we can tell in these in these moments, you know, if if you have a majority population, you speak a majority language, you identify with a certain uh, you know lineage, the Habsburgs rather than say the Bolsheviks. Yeah, I, I'd pick one side over the other too. Or even even like the Polish government. Like even even uh, the Polish kings uh, of old before, uh, like Polish Lithuania, definitely not there. It's they're identifying with the the Austro-Hungarians. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, and I mean uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire has been you know dead for twenty years at this point. Although Lemberg was ceded, so overwhelming was Hitler's victory that it was impossible for the Germans to cough up all of the territory promised to Stalin without causing disruption in transport and logistics. The rapidity of the Nazi advance meant that the Wehrmacht had overstepped the demarcation line not only in Lemberg, but also in L the Lublin province and the entire area between Vistula and the Berg, Bu uh, Bug rivers. I'm sure that's pronounced differently, but forgive me. On September 27th, after the defiant Poles finally ran up the white flag in Warsaw, Ribbentrop flew to Moscow to settle the disposition of Polish territory. Demonstrating the superior leverage Stalin enjoyed, Hitler was still the diplomatic supplicant, even though the Germans had done all the work. Cleverly, Molotov conceded German gains in central Poland, including the province of Lublin and parts of the province of Warsaw, pressing a Soviet counterclaim on Lithuania. By agreeing to this, Ribbentrop unwittingly played into Stalin's hands, handing over the rich farmland and industry of the partly Germanic Lithuania and concentrating Germany's gains in the most ethnically Polish areas of Poland. The Soviet-occupied zone, by contrast, was less Polish, with Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Jews outnumbering the Polish minority, which made up at most 40 to 50 percent of the population. All this reinforced the impression in the West that Hitler was the primary aggressor in Poland and Stalin a more interested bystander. It's, it's, and I said this several times while reading the book, but it's just amazing how much Stalin gets away with and how much people play into his hands. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I don't think that, I don't think that that can be, 
uh, understated. Yeah, I mean, at what point do you not look at this and you realize that this even acknowledging this section here raises a lot of uncomfortable, uh, you know, questions with the the liberal understanding of the sort of blank slateism tabula rasa world they want to live in. You know, if you're if you're attacking an area or you occupy an area that is of one high concentration, and the rest seems to be in, incredibly diversified between Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Jews, then. Oh, look at that. You know, you can be viewed as the aggressor in this place into the hands of Stalin better. And it's not even that Nick Meekin at any point in this book, you know, tries to quote unquote redeem um, Mr. Adolf in any way, shape or form. Uh, it really just does illustrate that, you know, from the from the views of ethnicity, from the views of, of territorial conquest and claiming uh, Stalin kind of had a, a pretty good claim here to look as least interested he's like look all that i've done is you know claim territory in areas which the soviet union has interest in which would be ukrainians belarusians and the jews that lived there versus oh well you know the the reich has all these polish people that they've been dealing with and has done most of the fighting clearly they're the aggressors trying again to push that policy of let's get the west to fight a war with germany again In a crowning touch of Soviet diplomacy, the new Soviet-German frontier was largely tracked by the Curzon Line proposed at Versailles, neatly reversing the verdict of the 1920 Polish-Soviet War, which had allowed Poland to expand its further borders eastward. All Stalin had done, Molotov could and did claim, was to restore the old borders of Tsarist Russia, borders once acceptable to Western powers. David Lloyd George, the former prime minister who had been in power, then parroted Molotov's line in the Sunday Express on September 24, 1939, arguing that Stalin's conquest did not really amount to a fourth partition of Poland, as he had only seized Ukraine and white Russia, annexed by Poland in 1920 against the wishes of the Supreme Allied War Council. How Poland's London ambassador, Count Edward Razinski, objected, did Lloyd George reconcile his endorsement of Stalin's dismemberment of Poland with Britain's security guarantee on the ground on which grounds it had gone to war? By October 1939, Molotov had worked out the talking point that nine-tenths of new Soviet territory was, quote, former Soviet territory. That is, it had been Soviet for a few months in the winter of 19 to 1920, in between the Russian Civil War and the Polish-Soviet War. Yeah, that. never, never believe a politician whose causes belly is moral. They're lying. They're always lying. And, you know, uh, there's that there's that um, Peter Hitchens book, uh, The Phony Victory, right? Yeah. Uh, where he talks about like, well, how can we say that we won World War Two when the whole reason we went to war was to protect Poland and we just gave them to the Soviets? Uh it's and it's very clear towards the end of this chapter. We'll we'll get to uh, to it in a second, but it's very clear that the the Western powers don't want to go to war with the Soviet Union. The only reason that they made these guarantees was to go to war with Germany. Yeah, which I mean, I mean that's that can be that can be your prerogative if you're if you're uh, running a state. But then, I, I guess the thing that that you know. Don't the thing that really bothers me about um, progressives and and liberalism in general is that it, it everything is couched in moral language. You're a bad person if you don't go to war. It's couched in passive moral language as well. You know, it's always that passive voice that they use. We're doing this for the, the, the uh, for the good of humanity. I think I think it was Oren McIntyre who had that tweet where it's um, uh, earlier, either today or yesterday. He was talking about how uh, liberals can only. Oh yeah, they were see they were the in, they were interviewing a West Bank settler, and it was uh, I think it was a, a, a Jewish journalist questioning like. How, how can you look at this and be so concerned about the humanity? Whereas the West Bank settlers like, well, I'm focused on my children and my people. Right. You know, that kind of basic knee jerk, any, any rational sane human being would have a knee jerk reaction to prioritize their own people and their own family. Um, and so she, you know, this, this journalist is absolutely bewildered that, you know, Oh, humanity, the human race 
and the, the the settler is just like no there's there's just my people really this is uh it's me before my brother my brother before my cousin my cousin before my nation my nation before the rest of the world yeah um but again th- th- that is i think a really big issue when it comes to dealing with the the mind of liberals uh, is is that you know the, this passive voice this moral human race claim is always just used to justify some bizarre form of of um, cruelty. And I mean, Oswald Spangler said it best, or not, no, not Oswald Spangler, it was Carl Schmitt in the concept of the political, that, you know, whoever uses the term humanity is always trying to justify and create a demarcation line between who's human and who isn't. That way you can conduct the worst form of inhumanity against your enemies. And I think that... Uh, Schmidt has never uh, that that has never been disproven. I mean, you just have to look at the Sherman posters. Online. Yeah, uh, who don't who have no relationship to the the America of that year anyway. It, I I love it when uh, people like Sorab Amari Sherman post, and I'm like, you're a recent immigrant from Iran in the last thirty years. You have no right to this at all. Um, but I learned it, he recently unblocked me on Twitter. I think it's because I reviewed his book. I thought that anywho. was funny. Anywho, yeah, but yeah, yeah, anyways, you should you should post on his timeline, or yeah, just tag him in a bunch of posts uh, about how much you disliked his book. No, I'm not uh, until I'm not he a, blocks you again. I'm not a compl- I, I thought my my review did a, a good enough job of explaining why I don't like his book. It's a shitty book. It's I just, wonder if uh, he read it. I hope he did, and I because I don't know, but um, all all I all I will say is is that it's a bad book. Go read my review in the Mars review of books. It's a bad it's a bad book. Read my review. Significantly, however, the new Soviet border lines contained two non-Curzon deviations westward, which both Hitler and the Western Allies might have found alarming had they been paying closer attention. At Belyostok and Lvov Lemberg, the Soviet salients now thrust out like fists. The southern salient also contained oil fields in East Galicia, uh, Dorobyk, and Borislav, which Molotov had insisted on having over Ribbentrop's strenuous objections. It also provided as strategic glasses for the Red Army and the Red Air Force to threaten Romania and its oil fields and refineries, on which Germany and all the North Sea ports blockaded by the British fleet since the start of the war depended depended for most of its petroleum. On this, every other significant point of contention, Stalin got his way. That, That could be a good title for the book. Stalin got his way. Yeah, just just his whole life it seemed like even even post World War Two and even really yeah just his whole life Stalin got his way. Uh, so yeah, should, someone should write a, a Stalin biography and just call. And it. now he has a really nice grave in Red Square that yeah. is protected by the Russian state. Oh my! There is well, uh there well there was a video a couple of years ago of like this guy throwing a snowball at Stalin's grave and he was taken away by the fsb well that'll that'll do it won't it yeah. anyway anyway for now though it was all smiles and the german soviet treaty of friendship cooperation and demarcation signed in moscow on september 28th hitler and stalin boasted that they had created a sure foundation for a lasting peace in eastern europe and that they had aimed to put an end to the state of war existing between germany on the one hand and england and france on the other Why those countries had declared war on only one of the states invading Poland was left unsaid. If the Western powers did not yield, they continued with a hint of menace. The governments of Germany and the Soviet Union shall engage in mutual consultation with regard to necessary measures. Still more ominous was a secret supplementary protocol to the treaty. This stated that neither Stalin nor Hitler would tolerate in their territories any Polish agitation which affects the territory of the other party. They will suppress in their territories all beginnings of each agitation and inform each other concerning suitable measures for this purpose. An additional confidential protocol laid down the principles for a forcible population exchange with the Soviets allowing Reich nationals and other persons of German descent to migrate westward, and the German government agreeing to turn over or expel persons of Ukrainian or white Russian descent residing in the territories under its jurisdiction. What these secret protocols meant for the unfortunate people of the occupied Poland soon became clear. In the German zone Hitler's SS, Einstabsgruppen moved in, arresting and interrogating thousands of Jews and Polish elites, from civil servants to doctors, Catholic priests, and university professors. 
Although some Ukrainians and Belarusians were allowed to migrate into the USSR, the vast majority of Polish and especially Jewish detainees were sent to concentration camps or simply shot as nearly 50,000 victims were by the year's end. Um, and that's from Morehouse's Devil's Alliance. Yeah, and... Okay, so if you want to understand why Poland is as Catholic as it is, th there it is right there. I mean, the, just the, the shooting of uh, Catholic priests on both sides, both the, the Germans and the Soviets, uh, were, did not look too kindly on the Catholic Church, uh, as well as, uh, you know, post post-war Soviet Poland suppressing all religious uh, iconography and religious gatherings. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's why you have probably the, the, the last nationalist religious European nation in Poland right now. Or, yeah, in, in Europe right now. All right, uh, continuing on. In the Soviet zone of eastern Poland, Stalin's NKVD wasted no time rounding up the enemies of the proletariat as his merchants, aristocrats, Catholic priests, and above all, military officers. Although in theory, Polish civilians were deported only if they were found guilty of crimes such as belonging to the wrong social class, in practice, basically anyone captured in Poland by the invading Red Army, with the exception of certain Germans, Ukrainians, Belarusians, were separated out by ethnicity, were subject to deportation as a prisoner of war. On the principle of collective guilt already familiar to Gulag victims, the NKVD made sure on arresting Polish class enemies to arrest their entire families too. The first trains of deportees left eastern Poland on September 20th, 1939. A hint of the rationale for the deportations came five days later when Stalin's NKVD chief, Lavrent, Lavrent Tiberia ordered that 25,000 Polish war prisoners be put to work building the Novograd, Polianski, Rono, Dobno, Lvov Road, and ordered as swiftly approved by the Politburo. An idea of an immense scale of the operation can be gleaned from a Politburo resolution from December 1939, which stipulated that a captured Polish slave laborers assigned to work in the forestry would be distributed to Siberia on the basis of 500 to 100 to 500 families per village. So just moving entire ethnic groups out in Siberia or forced into labor into building a uh, rail line. Um, yeah, that the would Soviets got really major... good at that. Yeah. Conditions facing Stalin's Polish deportees were abysmal. One typical train car into which 36 Polish prisoners had been crammed took six weeks to reach Moscow, during which, the survivor recalled, bread and water had only been given to the prisoners a few, on a few regular intervals. All but three perished on the journey. Once a week, the survivor continued, the truck door had opened just, in, uh, just enough to enable the dead to be dropped out. Corpses of children froze in the snow, and their mothers, vainly, strying to, vainly striving to restore them to life, covered them with their own bodies and felt the same deathly chill creep up their own limbs and touch their own hearts. Sovietization of occupied Poland also brought on with a theft of massive scale. A German liaison officer reported on October 28, 1939, before the Soviet frontier was hermetically sealed and he was forced to believe that plunder and forced evacuations went hand in hand. It was not the seizure of valuable items that struck the German officer, but the pilfering of common goods that were rare or unknown under communism, such as watches, rings, and cigarettes, bed linens and household tools, even nails, needles, string, and paper. In a replay of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, the NKVD emptied Polish prisons of genuine criminals, urged them to rob the rich, and filled their prisoners with bourgeois victims of stubborn enough to resist their own expropriation. Peasants were urged to kill their landlords and employees, their employers. As one witness observed, mass murders with axes suddenly became frequent. One horrific incident saw a man tied to a stake before his skin was peeled off and wound salted before he was forced to watch the execution of his family. Piggybacking on the Polish class war cynically encouraged by the NKVD, Soviet planning ministers arrived on the scene to nationalize property, that is, to transfer title of Polish real estate, industrial and commercial property, to the Soviet state. Just as Russia in 1917, now the priority for Poland was the banks where the money was. An ex-Polish Galicia, now western Ukraine, alone, Pravada reported 
on the communist pride in March 1940, the Soviet occupiers had laid claim to 414 banks and 1,500 other credit institutions. In each bank, they opened the vaults and helped themselves to a greater part of the contents deposited there. In more rural agricultural area of an ex-Polish western Belarusia, the Soviet occupation brought with it a smaller scale reenactment of the Ukrainian Holodomor of the early 1930s as private land holdings were divided up into 605 collective farms onto which hundreds of thousands of farmers were herded like cattle. To counter the popular resistance that inevitably greeted such policies, the NKVD established a special occupation tribunal. In the upside down moral world of Stalinism, the Politburo resolution creating them, dated October 3, 1939, authorized occupation judges in western Ukraine and western Belarusia to try offending locals for, quote, war crimes. <clears throat> An interesting legal concept in the view of the fact that the USSR had never declared war on a country it was now occupying. The pretext was that these provinces never justly belonged to Poland in the first place, so anyone resisting was uh, the Soviet occupation authorities was not a foreign subject nor a war prisoner to uh, protected under the Geneva Convention, which the Soviet Union never ratified anyway, but merely a counter-revolutionary. And yet, awkwardly, the resolution hinted at a ghost-like existence of some legal entity known as Poland when it authorized tribunals to try crimes committed by serving soldiers of the former Polish army. Always believe communists when they tell you they want to kill you and they will do anything they can to kill you. Uh, I think that's a lesson that needs to be learned in the United States. Uh, we think that our laws and our constitution protects us from, you know, the barbarity uh, that these people bring, but that's, that's unfortunately not the case. And we're going to see it more and more. Yeah. When, uh, when a leftist tells you what they believe in, uh, believe them. I mean, this is why, you know, uh, Always With Honor is such an important read, because in the midst of this revolution, you know, people are going to to church to, to shop and they act like nothing's wrong while someone gets snatched up in the middle of the night or killed in the street. There's a there's another Gulag book uh, that you should read besides, you know, Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. It's called uh, Kalima Tales by, uh, damn, what's his name? Uh, the name will come to me. I'll tell you. I'll, uh, whoever can comment below uh, if you've made it this far, uh, who wrote Kalima Tales? Uh, that's that's uh, a great selection of of stories about the Gulag. Mm. Someone will will probably um, tell us in a moment here in the chat. Uh, <laughs> or not chat, but in the in the comment section. Or someone will, will DM me or ping me and tell me who it is, and I'll, and I'll put it in the description afterwards. Despite the show of solidarity between the two totalitarian powers, there was already a rough division of loyalties on the ground, reflected in the target, how the targeted populations voted with their feet. And by the end of 1939, nearly 350,000 Polish Jews caught in the German zone had been expelled or fled to the Soviet-occupied towns of Lvov, Lvov, Lemberg, and Bialatstok, where they were initially welcomed, but many discovered to the horrors of privation and forced labor in the Soviet gulag camps only later. Ukrainian nationals in Galicia and eastern Poland in turn fled west into German arms because it was initially conquered by the Germans. Lemberg, Lvov emerged as a key transit point for groups trying to flee the Red Army, such as the Ukrainian People's Republic, a successor to the government in exile of the short-lived Ukrainian Republic of 1918 to 1920. Huh. Although you, uh, huh, yeah. Although Ukrainian activists who escaped into the West Zone into Germany or the German Zone, such as the head of the radical wing of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, such as Stepan Bandera, were kept under close surveillance. They were not turned over to the Russians either. Many Polish elites in Lemberg, Lvov, too, had welcomed the Germans, hoping for better treatment than they would receive under Stalin. Enough did, at any rate, justify a horrific crackdown against Ukrainian and Polish nationalists by the NKVD after the Reds arrived. Arrived. In an ironic communist homage to Nazi racial politics, only the, 
those able to demonstrate German ethnicity in the Soviet zone were allowed to migrate westward into the Reich. With black humor, Stalin in October 1939 appointed as his representative of the Soviet German Commission on the Evacuation of Germans from Soviet-occupied Poland, Maxim Litvinov, the Jewish foreign minister he had sacked five months earlier to extend his olive branch to Hitler. Oof. And um, this is where I will, uh, again, uh, recommend the uh, book on the years of great silence by by J. Otto Pohl, which covers the deportation, special settlement, and mobilization into the labor army of ethnic Germans in the USSR, 1941 to 1955. If you want to know what the the Soviets did to ethnic Germans, I would uh, highly recommend uh, you read Mr. Pohl's book. Uh, if you want to understand what the Soviets did to the Germans and to, to uh, appoint um, a, a Jewish foreign minister that you had just sacked to now represent the issue of the Germans, uh, the utilization of certain ethnic groups as a weapon is very much on display here. In these ethnic prisoner swaps, the Soviets generally got the better end of the deal as with everything related to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. In exchange of allowing tens of thousands, ultimately 150,000 of German nationals to enter the Reich, Stalin acquired hundreds of thousands of bodies to fill his labor camps, with some estimates as running as high as 1.5 million Polish and Jewish deportees by early 41, a figure larger than the German repatriations by a factor of 10. The number of victims murdered by Soviet authorities in occupied Poland by June 1941, about 500,000, was likewise three or four times higher than the numbers of those killed by the Nazis. Just going to let that sink in there. Amazingly, despite his own war of conquest against Poland being, if not as deadly as Hitler's during the military phase, then marked by a geometrically larger number of executions and deportations in a far more destructive and economic terms. The Vaults received not even a slap on the wrist from Western powers uh, for his crimes. Some of the discrepancy in the Western reaction to the German and Soviet invasions owed to Molotov's outwitting of Ribbentrop and his central Poland for Lithuania swap, which created a diplomatic illusion that Germany had conquered Polish Poland and Russia merely still a small ex-Soviet, not altogether Polish sliver of it. For neither the first nor the last time in the 20th century, German diplomats had proved just as inept as its generals had been competent. Uh, Uncle Joe didn't do anything wrong, guys. Come on. Yeah, a lot of um, a lot of ignorance on uh, not ig well. There's a lot of naivete that plays in here, but also it kind of does illustrate, I think, in when we look at the relationship later on in this book between the West and the Soviets. You know, just a oh, wee bit of malice. Just, just a wee bit of malice, and just a wee bit of we, we'd rather side with um, the Soviets over fascists. Still, we should not let Western statesmen off the hook. British and French leaders chose to swallow Molotov's lies about Stalin reclaiming former, former Soviet territory, not because his lies were clever, but because they wanted to believe them, as so as to avoid armed entanglement with the Soviet Union at a time when they were already having trouble to figure out how to defeat Germany alone. As Foreign Minister Halifax explained to the British War Cabinet on September 17, 1939, he and the French ambassador Charles Corbin had earlier agreed to the provisions of the Anglo-Polish agreement would not come into operation as a result of the Soviet aggression against Poland, since the agreement provided for action taken by His Majesty's government only if Poland suffered aggression from a European power, emphasis the book. The, in their grasping for legal straws to avoid entanglement with Stalin, Halifax and Corbin had adopted a view of Slavophile intellectuals that Russia was not really a European country. Realizing how absurd this sounded, Halifax informed the War Cabinet that whatever the text of the agreement may have said, there was an unwritten understanding between the two governments of Britain and France that the European power in question was Germany. On this interpretation, Halifax concluded in his odd legal briefing, Great Britain was not bound by the treaty to become involved in a war with the Soviet Union as a result of their invasion of Poland. Minister Corbyn has indicated that the French government took the same view. The Allied cause was not one of principled objection to armed aggression as such, but to German aggression specifically. Hitler's invasion of Poland, less cynically camouflaged than Stalin's, was easier to grandstand against. Uh, another another sort of historical figure that gets lambasted is uh, Halifax. He's he's seen as 
you know, a, a an appeaser as well as as Chamberlain, and he it, and steps forward, or, or or even more so, he's seen as like sort of a uh, a German uh, sympathizer, and I think that that doesn't exactly bear out here. No. A lot of anything, anything to to make Churchill look really good, no matter what the truth is. Yeah, and I I also think that uh, in in this instance here, what you know, we 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 want to we we want to believe the sweet little Soviet lies, um, and it's easier, of course, to to grandstand against Germany. You know the. The, those those damn Germans, those eternal Germans, and the eyes that some still have towards the Germans and the French, even to this day, in, in an English sense. But you know, again, uh, we're willing to work better with communists. But also, there's the realistic expectation that, like, look, if we're having a hard time against Hitler, we're not fighting two great powers at once. We we can't do it. Um, and that, that's also important to consider here is, is that you can you can come up with a legal loophole or a a moral position that, oh, they prefer communism over fascism or whatever. But at the end of the day, there was no way 1939 or even 1940 or 41 Britain was able to fight against the Germans and the Soviets at the same time. That was just that, an impossibility. They would have lost any kind of conflict with both of them. Uh, Halifax was not the only moral relativist in Whitehall. The British cabinet refused to even issue a mild diplomatic protest at the Soviet invasion of Poland or to withdraw the British ambassador from Moscow. The French ambassador to the Soviet Union did at least submit a formal note of protest. The furthest the war cabinet would go was temporarily delay the release of critical strategic exports to the USSR, including copper, tin, and machine tools sent to Russia's Arctic ports of Archangel and Murmansk. In an astonishing act of diplomatic back blackmail, Molotov threatened that if Britain did not cough up these supplies, Stalin would intern the crews of all British ships in Archangel and Murmansk, and he even prevented Britain's ambassador from communicating with the captains. Stalin did not uh, need not have worried; he would have gotten his copper and tin from London. Again, uh, I, our, Stalin our, gets this way. Our our pal Uncle Joe just being such a good guy. Yeah. What, 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 sure, what, surely what, what this won't bite us in the ass someday. Yeah. Surely not. Heaven forbid. Give them everything they want. Everything they want. Don't you worry about it. Everything they want, they'll they'll get it. Don't you worry. Strengthening the hand of the Stalin appeasers in White Hall was Chamberlain's addition of Winston Churchill to the War Cabinet as First Lord of the Admiralty on September third. For all his principled bellicosity, Churchill was perhaps the strongest of his anti-Hitler stance, because of his strong anti-Hitler stance, a curiously soft touch on Stalin, a neat reversal of the positions underlining, underlying Chamberlain's appeasement policy in 38. Churchill saw the Soviet dictator as a potential ally in the war against Hitler, the current alliance between Berlin and Moscow notwithstanding. On October 31st, 1939, in a series of wartime radio addresses to the BBC, Churchill defended the USSR's invasion of Eastern Poland in the interest of its own safety and pointed out that the Soviet, the forward Soviet position there posed a roadblock to German expansion. This address was not, was welcomed by the Soviet ambassador in London, Ivan Maisky, who called on Churchill at the Admiralty to thank him. Churchill assured Maisky that Britain would also view the Soviet expansion to the Baltic region favorably as a counterweight to German influence. In a meeting to, of the War Cabinet on November 16, 1939, Churchill still went further endorsing Stalinist aggression. No doubt it appeared reasonable to the Soviet Union, Churchill argued, to take advantage of the present situation to regain some of the territory Russia had lost as a result of the last war, at the beginning of which she had been an ally of France and Great Britain. That Hitler used the same justice that Hitler used the, had used the same justification for Germany's territorial claims on Poland either did not occur to Churchill, or he simply didn't bother him. Nor did it trouble him that, as he predicted, Stalin would shortly apply the same rationale not only to the Baltic territories, but also to Finland. Far from being opposed to Soviet aggression, Churchill argued that it was for British interests that the Soviet Union should increase their strength in the Baltic, thereby limiting the risk of German domination in this area. The imperative for British policy in the short term, he argued, was to avoid making the mistake of trying to stiffen the Finns against making concessions to the Soviet Union. The fate of Poland was only the beginning of a heavy period of communist expansion made possible by the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. 
With a permission slip from Berlin and a green light from London, Stalin could now proceed to Sovietize the Baltic countries in Finland. And thus the end of chapter six of section two of Sean McMeekin's Stalin's War, A New History of World War II. I Lot still I still can't believe that this book got published. <laughs> as I as I said in other episodes, I think Sean McMeekin is one of the last respectable mainstream historians in in the West. And the fact that I don't think that he's a revisionist in any sense. I think he is simply reminding people that the West took such a blind eye or willingly accepted what was told to them by a duplicitous foreign entity if it meant that they could just take care of Hitler first. Which, I mean, you know, from a diplomatic point of view, fine, right? You know, you 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 have to make a deal with one devil. Go ahead. But the the thing that gets pointed out to me in this book most is just how willing how willing the west is to give the soviets whatever they want it, it doesn't and, and you know maybe maybe there needs to be and maybe, maybe mcmeekin needs to do a little bit more work on what the perspectives of the west are and at this point but i think he goes into it later in the book he, he, he does uh later in the book but i mean and especially on the american side of things but you have to, you know, I, I always think of that line that uh, these little so socialist Democrats and tanky types on Twitter that say that the, the liberals will always side with the fascists against the communists. Uh, I think that there is empirical proof that that is not the case. And if uh, this whole chapter did not just reiterate that, um, it just proves to tell you that uh, communists are mentally ill people that in even calling them people is generous. Um, but remember yeah. guys you don't hate communists enough you don't hate communists enough you don't hate fdr enough and you don't you, you just don't hate communists enough absolutely uh remember as, as mystery growth would say you know uh, communism is just a bunch of ugly deformed people that will rage against you and try and kill you at the moment they get the chance um i think that's a very important thing to consider in this instance but Mr. Hudson, what, what are your overall takes on this chapter as we as we round out our discussion on the the absolute rape and pillaging of Poland and the the Western reaction to it? Well, obviously, Uncle Joe gets whatever he wants. Uh, he he didn't do nothing. He's a good boy. But in all seriousness, it, it points out, and I mean, we're we're, we're going to just keep harping on just how badly England and France fumbled this situation. Uh, even it, it just from the diplomatic cables that we have between uh, the Germans and the Soviets at this point, it's clear that if there was a stronger Western response to the invasion, we could have, we, we could have prevented or at least at least punted all out war. But at the same time, uh, like I mentioned earlier, that's that's what every modern IR theorist says is uh, oh, just get involved now so that we don't have to get involved later. It's it's very it's a it's an attractive uh, move by by Western statesmen to get involved in in a war now so that we don't have to get in, involved in a bigger war later. And I think we're seeing some of those chickens come home to roost uh, with the with the current fights that are going on right now. Yeah, I, I think of, again, who who are you willing to side with or who's, you know, what what evils are you willing to, to look away from in, in respect to that? I mean, like but prior to the war in Ukraine in March of 2022, when the invasion started, I think, or the end of February, uh, I, I think of all those reports about how Ukraine is one of the most corrupt, you know, countries on earth. And then of course, everything that's happened inside with the Zelensky regime and the, you know, the, the deaths of hundreds of thousands and the displacement of millions, the continued persecution of the 
canonical Ukrainian Orthodox Church. You know, all of it just, again, uh, we, we see a lot of what has been said uh, already, you know, that we're willing to side with one if it means, you know, leveraging uh, the other. And so when you see individuals like, you know, Representative Dan Crenshaw, um, you know, blindly looking out at the state of affairs. That's right, dog. Yeah, Dan Crenshaw sucks. And you've got this terrible issue where all of a sudden, hey, it means that we don't have to fight this enemy, but we're willing to displace millions, let untold number of armaments go into the hands of terror groups, um, persecute more Christians, kill more people, uh, all because some people in the State Department have an ethnic blood feud with Russia. And here we are. So um, this book is very timely, I think, that to discuss both in the reference in the war in Ukraine, but also uh, what evils are are there that we might see our government look to the side uh, in order to achieve some greater goal against a perceived monolithic Reich, you know, look-alike axis of evil enemy, just as we saw at the beginning of the war on terror and what the new axis of evil might look like today in 2023. Oh, sorry about that. My dog decided to freak out for no reason. Oh, it's no worries. I understand, friend. Um, Mr. Hudson, where can people find your work and what do you do? Uh, so I'm a, I'm a novelist. I'm a fiction writer. Uh, you can find my work at on my Substack, uh, trhudson.substack.com. Uh, I also run, uh, I'm one third of the Double Dealer magazine which is a literary magazine from the South. Uh, though we, we peddle all kinds of fictions. Uh, that's uh, DBL underscore dealer at, on Twitter. So go ahead and, and follow us there. Uh, I've also decided to get my, throw my hat into the podcasting ring. Uh, yourself and me, well, you and I, I guess is the best way to put it, are... Uh, recording a session on the brothers uh, karamazov which is uh the greatest book ever written in my estimation or at least greatest fiction book ever written uh i know that you share that uh estimation as well and uh yeah i'm gonna be talking about literature from now on 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 substack uh so that's 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 everything that i do and i you know shit post from time to time well, who doesn't do a little shit posting from time to time? But Mr. Hudson, your 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 work will be tagged accordingly on Substack and uh, will be in the YouTube description. Of course, YouTube channel members will get to see this early. Um, by the time this episode drops, uh, chapter one will be all the way completed. Sec chapter five of section two will be finished as well. So uh, this will probably come out sometime next week, probably a Monday from now. So that would be uh, the 20th. So you'll be able to see me in my full Christmas regalia as you see my profile picture with it on. Um, I'll be in the midst of the nativity fast and uh, getting to enjoy that wonderful Christmassy feeling. But um, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to wrap up this chapter. Uh, next time we will be covering section or chapter seven, the gangster pact part two on the subject of Finland. So we've, we've just sort of covered the invasion of Poland and the absolute uh, destruction, ethnic partitioning, and just rape of this territory. And now we'll be moving on to Finland next. So thank you all for tuning in. Your ongoing support as little as $2 a month can ensure that you too get to see this content early and uh, keep this amphibian writing and shitposting on Twitter. And please give a visit to my friend, Mr. Hudson and his great work. And if you want to have a full access to this book, I have the entire PDF, all 800 and some odd pages on here. I, I will post that for free so everyone can go see it and read it themselves. This book is a must read from any mainstream historical source. So with that, I will bid you all farewell. <laughs>